Well, red is the colour of um, Pentecost because uh, it represents the tongues of fire that we that uh, we read about in uh, Acts chapter two, and it's fantastic to see that uh, um, arch of red balloons as we all came into the church. And as James uh, James said, well done to some of you for for wearing red on this uh, marvelous day in in the church's year. Um, I support the wrong football team, so I haven't really got any, any red clothes, except uh, um, I've got a red beach shirt, but uh, it's not really the weather for wearing beach shirts, so uh, I'm here in, as, as you see me. But I've got some red, red on my socks. There you, there you go. But uh, anyway, let's pray before we start thinking. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the warmth of your love. We thank you for the fire of the Holy Spirit and ask that you would touch us all today by your spirit and that you would change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible reading from Acts chapter 2 tells of the extraordinary events in Jerusalem on that day of Pentecost that we heard, heard about. With the benefit of hindsight, we realized that it was the birth of the church, although it wasn't called the church at that time. And nor were the people in the church at that time called Christians. That was to come a few years later. They were a group of about 120 people who knew Jesus of Nazareth, who were witnesses of his risen body, and they knew that he had returned to his father in heaven. And in the days since his ascension, they'd been spending a lot of time praying together, waiting with expectancy to see what God was going to go, was going to do. They were devout Jews who celebrated the various Jewish festivals. They knew, Pente they knew Pentecost as Shavuot, or the festival of the weeks. And it was the festival of the wheat harvest. In the much hotter climate of the Eastern Mediterranean, wheat is harvested at the end of May or the beginning of June. So the Pentecost festival was a great thanksgiving for the harvest, which in most years would bring food security for the year to come. And that might explain why at the beginning of our service, we, we, we heard one of our traditional harvest festival hymns. Now thank we all our God. But for those Jewish believers in Jesus who'd spent much time in the presence of God in the previous days, the festival would have been an outpouring of thanksgiving, not only for God's material provision, but for the gift of Jesus and the very presence of God amongst them, not knowing, but waiting with expectancy to see what God would do. The extraordinary events on that day of Pentecost were very unlike the experience that we have at Pentecost today. There are some of us who would have known dramatic, charismatic experiences in our own lives, or we've seen it in that of others. And that experience will most likely have profoundly transformed us and deepened us. But for many of us, speaking in tongues, prophecy, interpretation of prophecy, being slain in the spirit and the like will be unknown and maybe unwanted experiences. We may be fearful of such experiences or regard them as happening to those people who are emotionally unstable. But I want to emphasize as one who's not personally had a charismatic experience that these gifts come from a loving God who is good and that the gifts are given for the building up of the church. In the account told in Acts chapter 2, some in the crowd thought that Jesus' followers had been drinking too much. But Peter stood up and he used the Hebrew scriptures from the prophet Joel to explain that they weren't drunk, but the Holy Spirit of God had fallen on his friends, who were ordinary men and women from a whole range of backgrounds. The identity and the character of the Holy Spirit often seems a mystery, but he's best known by what he does. He draws alongside people from every background, from every ethnic group, from every nation, men and women, boys and girls, 
to give them a sense of the presence of God. And he speaks to the lives of those who wouldn't, who wouldn't currently call themselves Christians. Otherwise, how would any of us be able to call ourselves a Christian? Since different people have various methods of understanding the world, the Holy Spirit makes God real to different people through those different ways. Some of us are directed by what our heads tell us. We want to investigate. We want to see whether it's rational and to really understand it. Some of us are guided by our hearts and our feelings. And we search deep within us, wanting what we see to make sense to us with total personal integrity. Others of us are guided by our gut feeling. We're less cautious than the rational types who want to check the logic and the emotional types who want to be completely sure about their inner feelings. We're happy to take a chance and go with the initial impulse. God glories in the diversity of human beings. And the reality is that we cannot be divided into the three categories that I've just described. Each of us is a unique individual and special in the eyes of God. We've all been molded by our genes, by our upbringing, by our experiences, by the choices that we've made in our lives. We are truly unique individuals, but God loves and respects us as we are. And he communicates, he reveals himself to us. He uses education, experience, other people, but through all the means, he uses the Holy Spirit to make God known to us. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus is that God can be known by everybody and be a loving and positive part of our lives. In John 15 and 16 that we heard, Jesus tells his disciples that it is to their advantage that he goes away. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit won't come to them. Jesus describes the Holy Spirit as the advocate. The Holy Spirit is one who speaks up for us. He's one who helps us. The Holy Spirit speaks of what he knows about God, and he speaks the truth to us about God. In John 15, verse 26, Jesus says the Holy Spirit speaks on his behalf. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to those who will listen. In Romans chapter 8, verses 15 and 16, the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirits that we are children of our Heavenly Father. And in Romans, Paul uses the intimate Arabic word, Aramaic word, Abba, that Jesus himself used when praying to God his Father, the English equivalent of Abba being Dad. Not all of us have good role models of our parents, so some may find it difficult to conceive of a totally loving father or mother. But let us learn to trust God, the God of love, as an intimate parent, as one who knows us inside out and always wants the best for us. Sometimes the consequences of what's best might be painful. But one of the most important actions of the Holy Spirit is to help us to know deep inside us that God is with us, that God loves us, and that we can speak openly to him about our feelings and about all that is going on in our lives. Just read the Psalms. Take any Psalms almost at random to find out how the Holy Spirit enabled the writers to speak to God in their despair and in their joy. Romans 8 also tells us how the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. None of us find prayer to be an easy thing. However long we've been trying to pray, it's a very common experience of all Christians not to know how to pray. We don't know the words to use. Often we don't know what God's will is for ourselves or for the situation that we're praying. But the Holy Spirit can help us to pray with or without words. 
He gives us a sense of God's presence, a sense of being in communion with God. And being silent before God helps us to sense God in the waiting, in the listening, in the being, and in the expecting. In John 16, Jesus tells us more about the Holy Spirit's activity in our lives. In verse 13, we're told, the spirit of truth will guide you into all the truth. As we walk with Christ, we'll be given fresh insights into the reality of God. But the truth is that there will always be more truth to discover about God than we can ever discover in this life. We'll always be scratching at the surface of the depth, the breadth, the majesty, and the sheer wonder of God. And when we're open to the Holy Spirit, we will retain that necessary humility before our God. But the Holy Spirit's activity also comes very close to home. In guiding us to the truth, he guides us into the way that we should be living our lives. In John 16, 8 and 9, we read, the Holy Spirit would tell us about sin and righteousness. Many people find in the early stages of their Christian life that after the great excitement and the discovery that God loves them and accepts them just as they are, they find more and more ways in which they feel as if they've let God down. They become more dissatisfied about the way that they are living. But when we come alive to the Holy Spirit of God, he touches our lives deeply and shows us more ways in which we can change. This, this can be discouraging. It can tempt us, to, tempt us to give up. But be encouraged that it's a sign of the Holy Spirit continuing to work in our lives and seeking to draw us closer to God. Those of us who've been Christians for long should be wary of being complacent and presumptuous about our own lifestyles. It's with a great joy that Ludo Wolf is being baptized this morning. His mother Emma and godparents are opening up not only his life, but also their own lives to the warmth of God's love through the Holy Spirit. And later on during this service, we'll pray that Ludo grows in understanding and he comes to know God for himself. The Pentecost festival, according to the Acts of Apostles, effectively tells us of the birth of the church. The church came into the being at the time of a festival of thanksgiving and gratitude to God. And as we thank God for who he is, for his provision, and for his existential presence in our, in our lives, the Holy Spirit will come alive in our own lives. If we want, the Holy Spirit will transform us. He will lead us in new ways. He'll give us new gifts. But those gifts will not be for our glory, but they will always be for the purpose of loving the people that we come across day by day in all our walks of life and for spreading the good news that God loves the world and every person who lives in it.